morning cornerstone, I want to read to you uh, from Hebrews 13, verse 7, which says, Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the results of their conduct, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. And I really like that last part. It is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. And I'm excited to be strengthened with you this morning, to be strengthened through the worship, through the preaching, through communion, and everything else that we get to share together this morning. I'm excited about it. So let's just pray that God would be a part of all of those things, and, and then we'll get to it. So God, thank you for the worship. Thank you for the word that you've given Dan and all the preparation that, that you've gone before and, and that you've prepared our hearts, you've prepared our minds, you've gotten us ready for this morning. And I thank you for all the things that you're gonna to bring to our hearts and that we are gonna be strengthened as we go through this next hour. And I just pray that that strength would be able to carry us through the next week. So I thank you for your goodness, God, and that you are gonna bring us strength this morning. Amen.
In O Holy Night by Adolf Adam, there is a line that depicts the peace of God as a thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. It's a breath of crisp mountain air, a sublime sunset, a breakthrough on a difficult project, or a baby's first cry after a hard night of labor. It's peace, a peace that settles deep into the bones and stills an anxious soul. Today marks the second day of Advent, a season recognized by the church around the world as a time to prepare our hearts and lives to welcome the coming of Jesus Christ. At Christmas, we track this season by engaging in several rhythms, one of them being to light candles, one for each week leading up to Christmas Day. Today we light the second candle, traditionally called the Candle of Peace. Isaiah 9 verse 6 is a popular scripture used in Advent. For unto us a children is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus says the child born to us with the internal the government of heaven on his shoulders as his responsibility. Jesus is in charge, will Jesus rule this there is peace. Please pray with me. Jesus, our peace, be near us when our lives seem far from peaceful. Assure us of your presence with us. We need you, Holy Spirit, and we cry out to you for help. Be our gentle shepherd, our wise king, and the peace of our hearts, we pray. Amen. 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 walking in fellowship with God and in love and harmony with your neighbors and you who do sincerely repent of your sin and intend to lead a new life following the commands of God and walking from this time in his holy ways draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and meekly make your humble confession to almighty God he's listening Let's tell him what he already knows. If there's anything that, any sin, anything, anything um, unconfessed that you need to tell him, now is your opportunity. Let's have a moment of silence. Let's pray. O God of grace and mercy, we thank you that you ever loved us and provided for our redemption. We thank you for your Son who died to save us and for your Spirit who invites us to draw near. Lead us now as we commemorate the suffering of our Lord. Help us to remember the cost of our salvation Help us to commune with you and with each other. And so consecrate the bread and the cup which are here prepared 
so that as we partake of them, we may receive the spiritual benefits of Christ's broken body and shed blood. In his name we pray. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Take and eat this, remembering that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. blood of our Lord Jesus Christ which was shed for you preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life drink this remembering that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.
morning, everyone. Last week, we lit the Advent candle of hope, and in the sermon, we said that, uh, that biblical hope is refusing to lose ourselves in the, in the twin false hopes of nostalgia and noise, but instead, uh, we learnt to embrace repentance going into the desert of Isaiah 40, hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, and starting to build a highway of hope that God can come into our hearts with. And and, and actually, over this past week, I've tried to take God's Word seriously. I've made some changes in my life. I've locked some uh, apps on my phone that... um, that that often lead to uh, to time wasting and uh, and actually only Wendy has the unlock passcode and I've realised how much time these apps can suck out of my life how much energy they use and how Satan can use them to lead me into a place of complacency and of laziness and sin now I've repented of this time waste and. Uh, through the Advent devotions, I'm rebuilding this highway into my life, and I'm so grateful that God, through the Holy Spirit, has graciously revealed this area of rebellion in my own life, and it's, it's like he's been reconstructing hope in my life. And where we have hope, there we have peace. Where we have hope, there we have peace. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 8. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, Perseverance, character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of God. Okay, that passage is powerful, right? It's incredible. It's, it's like when you stand at Niagara Falls and, and you're in a certain spot and you look out and you go, whoa, and then you move along a bit and it's like, whoa, it's a whole new view. And then you go down behind the falls and you're like, no way. And, and then you go down onto the maid of the mist and you're looking up at the falls and it's like, this is amazing. And then you travel over to the American side and you look back at the Canadian side and you're like, wow, this is so amazing that Romans 5, 1 through 8 uh, can, just like Niagara Falls, it can overwhelm uh, the senses and the mind. It's so powerful and it seems to move so fast. And you just want to tell Paul, Paul, could you just slow down for one second and like stay on one thought for more than a couple of seconds? Um, I, I I was in a garden, um, it, it was a flower garden in, in, in Perth in the summer whilst Wendy was working at Silver Lake Camp. And while I was there, um, I was trying to take uh, a photo of a butterfly and, uh, with, with my Zoom camera. And every time I thought I had the butterfly in, in my crosshairs, it would flit away, and I was so frustrated, but with each flit of the butterfly, uh, my determination increased to get the photo that I wanted, and that's kind of what we have to do here. We need to take uh, photos of each phrase in Romans 5, 1 through 8, and kind of observe it and study it and allow it to cause us to fall in love with God even more, because what we're reading, what we see here is incredible. And so I've I've sort of made a... um, like a pact with myself that I want to memorize uh, Romans 5, 1 through 8 so that 
so that without even needing to read it in the Bible, I can linger over each phrase and just let it soak into my heart like a sponge. But this morning, um, we're not going to be doing a ton of lingering. Instead, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to join together all the dots so that we can see the big picture of Romans 5, 1 through 8. And then later on, you can go home and you can take one phrase at a time and you can roll them around in your mind and in your heart. So this morning, I just want us to see how it all ties together to help us see the whole forest um, before we see the individual trees. Now, this is how I understand uh, Romans 5, 1 1, 1 verse 2. Uh, First of all, we were enemies of God who were justified by faith through Jesus' death so that we can have peace with God, also known as reconciliation. Okay, so, and here we read it. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so that, that we could consider like the backwards look, we're looking back, and, and as we look back, we see justification through Jesus' death leading to peace and reconciliation with God. It's a great view. But then that leads us to the now. We've looked back. Now we're at the now, and we're looking down at what's underneath us. And now we are standing in grace. We are standing in grace through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Our current standing is grace. So if we're in Christ this morning, then this is our current reality. If you're in Christ, this is your reality. The grace in which you stand. The grace in which we stand. So we've looked back at peace And we've assessed our current understanding of grace. And now let's look forward. And what is it, according to Romans 5, that we're looking forward to? Well, Romans 5 tells us that there are two glories. First is the hope of the glory of God. And then verse 3, but also glory, glorying in our suffering. So it's the hope of the glory of God. First glory, second glory is glorying in our sufferings, is the glory of our suffering. So these are the two things we can look forward to. Uh, We were enemies. uh, We were justified by faith through Jesus' death so that we can be reconciled with God. We can have peace with him. We are standing in grace. We are standing on grace. And we look forward to the hope of the glory of God and the glory of our suffering. Or to put it in short terms, we look back at peace. We, we look down at grace and we look ahead at hope. This is the high-level view of Romans chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 5. Okay, so now I want to pause a moment on the first two verses, Romans 5, 1 through 2, looking back. Let's look back. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, I want you to notice this word, since. Okay, Uh, since we have been justified through faith. And so what Paul is saying is that if this is not true of you, then you cannot move on to the next level. Um, If you cannot look back at the peace that Jesus has won for you and you say, I have that peace. If you don't have the peace, then you're not standing in grace. You need faith that what Jesus did and achieved on the cross has been applied to your life. That his righteousness, that his holiness, that his his absolute perfection is now yours uh, because your sins became his. Friends, if this isn't your reality, then you need to be reconciled. If you've never trusted Jesus for salvation, then, then, then I ask you now, actually, if you're watching this online, uh, is to stop listening to the message and to go get reconciled with God, for you to go and get right with him. Because none of the rest of the message actually makes any sense if you haven't done this first. Okay, let's continue. Now, I've lived in Canada long enough to know that it's absolutely vital that you have the right winter clothes, right? 
in this fair country, I realized that every person needs multiple wardrobes. One wardrobe isn't enough. You need multiple wardrobes, and you change them as the seasons, uh, as the seasons go on. Like, Wendy's, Wendy's come home in the past with a coat, and she said to me, this is a good fall coat. This is a good fall coat, Dan. And she, uh, what she's saying to me in that moment is that this coat's usability starts from when summer is over and it stops being useful when the first snow of winter comes. She literally has a coat for, I don't know, something like six weeks or for two months. And then she needs a different coat. And she's not the only one, right? I have a fall coat as well. In fact, I have two fall coats and then I need a winter coat. Actually, last winter was the first winter um, I got myself a proper winter coat, and I love it, and I noticed the difference. But that's not the first time I realized the importance of uh, winter wear. You see, uh, the first time was when I went four-wheeling with my mate Jeff on the Rideau River in the cold of winter, and I was wearing gloves that would probably be fine for a Welsh winter, but not a Canadian winter. And so for um, an hour-long ride along the, this uh, frozen river, I was silently suffering. And in the end, I, I, I fessed up, and Jeff lent me one of the two pairs of warm Canada Proof, Canada Proof gloves that he was wearing. So I realized, that was when I first realized that winter wear and the proper winter wear is important. And the other time that I realized it was uh, years ago when I was actually taking out um, our Christmas tree after Christmas and I was taking it out to the side of the road and I was wearing uh, wellies, I was wearing rubber boots uh, because I thought that those are fine and we'd, we had just had freezing rain, I think it was. Um, and then these Walmart value wellies uh, clearly had zero traction because it it was not long before I ended up with my bum over my bonts, with my head over heels on the ground with a sore foot. And then I went inside, I removed my welly, my boot, and I realized why I had a sore foot, because my big toe was crossed over my other toes, like 90 degrees. It was pretty hideous looking. I was wearing the wrong footwear. And that's what Romans 5, 1 through 8 is all about. It's about wearing the right footwear. We need to be wearing the right shoes. Now, and now what verse 3 shows us in Romans 8 is what kind of um, landscape, what kind of uh, topography we are, we are facing. So verse 3, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Sufferings, that is the terrain that we're looking at, friends. Sufferings. Paul isn't waffling here. He doesn't try to spin some sort of a, some sort of a positive outlook. He assumes that we all suffer. Now, suffering, as we know, means pain, and suffering means hurt. And we, you know, you know, so we use phrases like ease her suffering or to end his suffering. You know, that suffering is something that we instinctually want to get out of or we want to rescue people from. You know, uh, but. Maybe then on the other side of the coin, if we're angry with someone, um, we might say something like, I just want to see him suffer for what he did to me. And yet Paul here is saying that we glory in our sufferings. Now, the word for glory here um, could also be translated as boast or exult, E-X-U-L-T. And it's the same Greek word that's used in verse 2, that we boast in the hope of the glory of God. So we boast in our sufferings, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Now, now, now the word, like, it kind of shocks me that the same word that's used to explain how we respond to the glory of God in verse 2 is the same word that is used uh, to help us respond to suffering in verse 3. And it's this word called kauhaumai. Kauhaumai is this word in Greek, kauhaumai. And so we... We, we boast, we kauhaumai in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also, we also glory or boast or kauhaumai in our sufferings. 
And so as we look ahead at the terrain, at the landscape of our lives, uh, we see two things. We see the hope of the glory of God, that moment that all of Jesus' disciples, all of Jesus' followers are longing for the hope of the glory of God, that moment when God's radiant presence is a reality, that moment when suffering stops. And so if, if, if we were to imagine that first thing, uh, it might be like us looking at a sunrise way over there on the horizon. We hope in the glory, or we glory in the hope, we boast in the glory, (laughs) one more time, (laughs) we boast in the hope of the glory of God, we boast in the hope of the glory of God, but in order to get there, uh, there's a landscape, there's a topography, there's a terrain that includes suffering, in order to get here, we need to go through here, so for us to get to the hope of the glory of God at the end of our life, we need to pass through suffering, the loss of friends and the loss of jobs and the loss of loved ones, being misunderstood, relational breakdown, having to choose God over success, having to choose God over popularity, having to say no to opportunities, saying no to sin, saying no to those things that we know will hurt ourselves, will hurt God. Um, or will hurt others, Uh, you know, um, losing our reputation for Christ, losing our comfortable lives, losing our jobs for Christ, even losing our lives for Christ. This is all suffering. This, uh, yeah, this is all that. And so life is, in a very real way, suffering. And so for us to get to the sunrise of the hope of the glory of God, we must walk through the valleys of the shadow of death, uh, through the valley of the shadow of suffering, of hardship, of self-denial, of learning how to go without. There's no way to get here to the hope of the glory of God except to pass through suffering. And yet Paul says that just as we can kauhaumai the hope of the glory of God, we can kauhaumai in suffering. We can glory in our sufferings. And it's all got to do with the type of shoes that we're wearing. You see, in the winter, I need winter boots. I don't need wellies. I need winter boots with good grips and layers of warmth inside them. My broken toe tells me that I need winter boots. And in life, I need to have peace. I need to put peace on. I need to wear peace to navigate the harsh terrain and the suffering of this life. I need peace. I need the peace of verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, you endure, to endure suffering, to endure suffering, you need to know that you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ in verse 1. Now, Ephesians uh, 4 verses, or Ephesians 6, 14 and 15, uh, words it like this. It says this, Stand firm then with the belt of truth around your waist, with a breastplate of righteousness in place. Here we go. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. There is a readiness. There is a, 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 a preparedness that the gospel of peace can bring into your life. Shoes of peace. Friends, it's only as you know through faith that you're reconciled to God, that things are right with God through Jesus Christ, that you can have the assurance that you're standing in grace, like verse 2 tells us. And it's only from a place, it's only from a foundation of grace, of knowing that God loves you and that Jesus died for you, it's only from this place of grace that you can step forward with confidence, and you can boast, you can kauhaumai in the suffering that is heading your way. We need to have our feet fitted, fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. 
And that's what verse 6 through 8 in Romans 5 is all about. It says here, you see at just the right time, this is the message of the gospel here, folks. This is what gives us the peace that leads to grace, that leads to hope. This is it. You see at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. You know, here's a righteous person, here's a good person, here's a noble person, someone that you might like and respect. Someone might possibly dare to die, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, we weren't righteous, we weren't good, we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's how God demonstrates his love for us. And so we look back and we see that God was so committed to our restoration, to our reconciliation, to our redemption, that he went way above and beyond what anyone would have expected. He didn't die for righteous people. He didn't die for good people. No, he died at just the right time. When we were powerless, when we were still powerless, when we were still sinners. He didn't wait for us to clean up our act or to put on a good shirt or to try to prove how worthy we were. No, Jesus went down into that filthy pit and he lived there and he died there and his death created a stairway out of that pit of sin and into the grace in which we now stand. And friends, it's only when we look at where we were it's only when we recognize from where God has rescued us, where, from where he's lifted us up, that we can look up at the mountains in our lives and we can say, suffering may be ahead, but I trust my God who suffered for me and who lifted me out of the pit from where I was. Friends, the depths from which Christ has rescued us are incredible. We have no way to understand what it meant for Jesus to humble himself and become human and live among us and for him to die for us. But, but even though we can't understand it, we can try to explain it. And Paul in Philippians chapter 2 verse 6 tries to help us understand. Listen to these words. Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He didn't do that. Rather, he made himself, here, here we go, this is, this is his condescension. This is him, him lowering himself. He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, going down and down and down, and being found in appearance as a man. He, once again, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death and not only death even death on a cross he 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 uh he had the reputation of a criminal he had the reputation of someone who was no good he started up here and he ended up down here and while he was down here he lifted us up to here this grace in which we stand, this grace in which we now stand. And it's from this place of grace in which we stand that we know that we can boast, that we can cow how my in the hope of the glory of God, knowing that our ultimate destination is where Jesus currently is. He was here, then he was here, now he's here again, and that is our hope. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave them the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Friends, this is our destination. Jesus in the highest place, the hope of the glory of God. And knowing that, that this is our hope, this is what enables us to kauhaumai, to boast in our sufferings. Why? Because it's through our suffering that we get there. 
It's through our suffering that God continues to transform us. It's through our suffering that God does work in our lives, that God sanctifies us. He, he sanctifies us through our suffering. Listen to verse 2 and 3 of Romans 5. And we boast. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also boast. We glory in our suffering. And why is that? Here's the answer. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character Hope, there it is again, that word hope, glorying or boasting in the hope of the glory of God, this hope. Friends, the Bible is clear that suffering is a part of life. There's no way to get away from it. it and, it's, it's, and it's actually one of the main ways that God, in his wisdom, uses to hone us, to mature us, to, to, to create this piece of art that he's working on. It's through suffering that we learn perseverance. There's no other way to learn perseverance except through suffering. You do not learn, learn perseverance through easy street. And it's through, it's through perseverance that we develop character, that we become fully formed, 3D, empathetic individuals, human beings who care for each other and love each other and come alongside each other. It's through suffering that leads to perseverance, that leads to character, that leads to hope. You show me a Christian who has suffered, and I will show you a person who's learned perseverance, who, who has character, and because they have character and they're growing in Christ-likeness, according to verse 4, that person has hope. Hope is not the absence of suffering. Hope is only found through suffering. You see the connection here, friends, that we boast in the hope of the glory of God and we boast in our sufferings because it's through our sufferings that we arrive at that hope. And as verse 5 tells us, hope does not put us to shame. This is not a silly hope or a weak hope or a frail hope. It's not a wishful thinking hope or a I hope for the best. No, this is a hope that does not put us to shame. It's a hope that we can be proud of. It's a hope that we can glory in, that we can in, that we can boast in. Why is that? Why is this a hope that does not put us to shame? Verse 5 tells us, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This verse, verse 5, says that we never ever walk the path of suffering alone. We have God in us. We, ha we, we have God as our past peace, and we have God as our current place of grace, and we have God as our future of hope, and God is our companion as we travel there. So we, we look back at peace, we stand in grace, and we move forward in hope. And we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, who is God's love poured out into our hearts. So friends, I don't know what you're going through right now. I really don't know. I cannot read your mind, but I suspect, like our theme, that, that you are weary I don't know the trials that you face. I don't know that wh what the doubts are that you're dealing with. I don't know the depression that ravages you or the arrows from Satan which are afflicting you or the debt that threatens to overwhelm you or the loneliness that lockdown has brought upon you. I don't know any of this, but what I do know is that on some level, you are suffering. And so I invite you not to stop suffering, but I, I invite you to invite God into your suffering. 
I invite you to fit your feet with the readiness of the gospel of peace. I invite you to place your trust in Jesus if you never have and to allow him to lift you by faith into this place of grace in which you can stand and know that you're reconciled to God. And from this place of grace, you can look back and see where Jesus has lifted you from. And you can remind yourself of God's character, his love, his track record, his who he is, his attributes. You can look back, but you don't just look back. You also look down and you see the grace on which you currently stand. You feel it firm under your feet. You know that it's not going to move. You feel the confidence that God's present grace brings into your life. And then after looking back at peace and looking down at grace, you then look forward in hope. The hope of the glory of God. That's where we're headed. And I, and, and I ask you to boast in the hope of the glory of God. And then with the Holy Spirit indwelling you, communicating God's love to you, um, I, I, why don't we step forward into the sufferings of the await, and we can glory in those sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, that perseverance produces character, and that character produces hope. And we can look forward in hope because we stand on grace, and we can stand on grace because we look back at peace. We're wearing the right footwear for the right season. This season is suffering, but our shoes are peace. We are fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. These shoes, they, they will give us sure footing. They give us confidence in the Lord that we're reconciled to him, that we're standing in grace, that we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're ready for the hope that comes from character, the character that comes from perseverance, and the perseverance that comes from suffering. Let's pray. Lord, this is a hard passage, but a hopeful passage. It's one that breaks apart uh, our categories and our preconceptions, Lord, that it, it ruins, it, it, it rips into pieces the idea of the blessed life, of the life of no suffering and no hurt, Lord God. But we realize that if we want hope, then we need to have character. And if we want character, then we need to learn perseverance. And the only way that we can learn perseverance is through hope. But Lord, we do not hope in vain. Because thank you, Holy Spirit, that you indwell us, that you are God's love poured into our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that we can look back at peace, that we can look down at grace, and we can look forward in hope. Jesus, you are such a good God, and we thank you for all that you have done, all of the grace and the peace and the hope that you've poured into our hearts in abundance, Lord. Help us to realize it afresh. Help us to glory in the, in the message of the gospel. Help us to glory in the hope that we have in you. We ask this in the name of the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
后。